it costs less than holding runoff elections, and studies show it's popular with voters and reduces negative attacks. That's why cities and states are looking to rank choice voting to improve their elections. Would rank choice voting help in your community? Find out more at fairvote.org. Will TV is filmed for a live studio audience being held against their will. Oh, shit. Today, guys, on the show, we have Mike Royce, Men of a Certain Age. Love that shit. We also have a musical performance by the Condomidiates, some pop punk band coming out of Tempe, Arizona. Let's head on over to Happy Harem in New York, George Carlin Podcast Studio, BJ Mendelssohn. Take the slack, my friend. I've run out of script. So, like, I have to ask just to dive right in. So, you're from Syracuse. So, um, very important question. Have you been to Dinosaur Barbecue? I have. I think I've only been once, though, because it really started after my time there. Ah. You know, it was, uh, I don't know when it, it got, I, I mean, I, I went to Ithaca College in 1982 and then left for New York City in 1986. And I think it must have started somewhere in there. Yeah. Oh, man. Um that seems to be the thing now for so if it's not college basketball, it's dinosaur barbecue. Yes, it's those are the two. Uh, <laughs> they own the, the town, from what I understand. <laughs> they, they truly do. Uh, so let me, but let me talk about things that are slightly more topical. Uh, you know, it, these interviews are only 20, 25 minutes, so I was kind of struggling with uh, how do I fit all of the shows you've worked on in, in that window, <laughs> uh, and because they all seem to have this wonderful second life. Uh, you know, it, I think of things like Enlisted and One Day at a Time that, you know, they were great the first time out, but they've aged so well. Or in the case of One Day at a Time, it just it kept growing and growing. So, um, but I want to ask you about Men of a Certain Age. So I'm going to apologize in advance to people who want to hear about all these other shows that are terrific. Um, Screw them. I want to talk about <laughs> Men of a Certain Age. No, I, all of them. But <laughs> <laughs> they're, they're, they're truly well. And for people who, who might not be familiar with Mike, uh, please, please do go. So, you know, Enlisted in particular, the past 10 years it has seemed to have had uh, a bit of a renaissance, which, which is kind of beautiful. I, I would love to see the numbers, uh, but yes. <laughs> uh, okay, so let me, I'm sorry, I've, I've talked a little too long, uh, but let me, let me get right into it. So, uh, Men of a Certain Age is the show that my dad, who is now 73, will wistfully stop and go, I wish that was still on the air. <laughs> <laughs> and he doesn't mince words at his age. And so I'm curious, I just would love to hear a bit about the creation of the show. Like what, what, I mean, what sparked the idea? Yeah, sure. First of all, just I want to give proper representation to, you know, a, yes. I have a certain age poster over there. Sorry for podcast listeners. I was just showing off the poster. Um, it was started as Ray and I were like both waiting. Ray was post Raymond. Not having not decided on his next big thing, he had done a couple of indie movies, and uh, I was waiting for Lucky Louie of all things to be picked up by HBO, and we just started like writing, which it wasn't, and we started writing a movie together, and that just meant we were getting. I would go to his office and we would talk about stuff we wanted to write a movie about, and then he, uh, since he was approaching 50 and I was, you know, I don't know, early forties, naturally both of our, our conversations just kept turning to death and everything that awaits us. Cause we were men of a certain age who were suddenly just in a therapy session together talking about everything that we were going through. And I think it was in those conversations, we just sort of realized that because we were discovering in ourselves at that time of life is when you're at the you know, a metaphor is like you're at the top of the mountain. It may not be that you're the most successful, but you're, it's the first time you're looking behind you and ahead of you. You know, I think before that, you're kind of just looking ahead. You're not doing a lot of reconsideration of like, where did I go wrong or whatever? And you're starting to ask, like, is this it or is there more? And when even someone as successful as Ray Romano, who had a gigantic hit on television was like, I mean, am I done? Do I just play golf now for the rest of my life? Even though I have untold amounts of money. Um, you know, we realize it's, it's like everybody relates to that. Everybody relate not to his specific situation, but to the feeling of 
I'm in the middle of everything. And you're in the sandwich generation between your parents and your kids. And then we talked about a lot of friends of ours. And then we came up sort of with these three characters, married, divorced, uh, uh, married, recently divorced, and never married, you know, um, consistently, consistent bachelor, all, all of all types that we knew many versions of. And it just sort of came together that way. And we developed it for HBO. HBO heard we were doing it. They made me a very nice development deal, mostly because I was writing something with Ray. I mean, completely because I was writing something with Ray. Um, and yeah, we developed it for HBO. They passed. They were nice enough to let us go to TNT. And that took a number of years, but finally we got it going at TNT. Yeah. Uh, and I feel like it was a little ahead of the curve of, of what people would call uh, the golden age of television, right? Like we're, we have these... With these flawed, comedic, but still very dramatic characters and scenes. And I, you know, I always kind of wonder, like, if the show had aired maybe five years later, it would have, it would have received some of the acclaim and attention that it deserved. And, and so I'm always curious, like, when these shows pass on, or like when you look back at the shows that you've worked on, do you, do you always think, man, I would love another shot at that? Or, you know, what's, there's, like, is there just part of your brain that's, that's always going back and thinking about, those programs absolutely um it's a conundrum because i always i have now with the benefit of hindsight realized that without you know the shows that failed i wouldn't have the shows that i then went on to care about that also then uh, i mean every show fails so uh, eventually ended so if men of a certain age had continued for four or five seasons i wouldn't have gotten to do un unlisted and listed and then if enlisted had continued i wouldn't have gotten to do one day at a time you know and every single time when each of those shows was canceled, it was super heartbreaking. So I got to be have my, my heart broken three times, but of course the privilege of working on them all three times. Men of a certain age, because it was coming out of such a, you know, the stories themselves weren't my personal story, but like a personal time that I was going through, coupled with TNT really let us do what we wanted to do. And it got a really good reception, so it wasn't like we were just indulging ourselves. Coupled with what you're talking about, that it was literally right before the streaming era. If it had just been a couple of years later, I think we would have been picked up by a streaming service, or we maybe would have developed it for a streaming service, and it would have lasted longer. It, you know, and 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 being able to do an hour long and and not you know sort of get out of the stuff that I'd done before. It certainly rankles that I would, you know, I really wish we could have done more. My mom has the same opinion as your dad. Every once in a while, she just goes, well, I, I, that one, I wish they, why isn't that still on the air? You know, I mean, she's biased, but you know. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's, it was, it was something that was truly unique for its time, right? Like, like I mentioned, it was, it was ahead of the curve and it stood out. I think for people that might not remember, uh, TNT and USA, that was during that time when, when they knew that they had to start developing. Right. original stuff but the and so they had kind of that wild west feel uh that allowed for shows like this to kind of come up and uh so but let me let me like refocus a little bit for people who are listening that there are writers that, that might be interested in sort of the, the process of how things wound up on on men of a certain age so i'm gonna, I'm gonna be uh 40 next year and so um i you know i'm now in that age group of uh, you know, the, uh, with you and Ray at the time, what did, did you were developing it? So, are there things that you just started to take note of as as you got older that where you're like, okay, that's that's something that's a thread I can pull on. Hey, it's me, God. I know it's been a while, and I haven't been the best dad, especially this century. Well, I was going through some shit, and you know what? I'm not going to talk about it. All you need to know is that I'm doing commercials now. I've got bills to pay too. Do you have any idea how much I just lost on crypto? A lot. A lot. And so now God needs your money. Like for real this time. Not like all those other times every Sunday. You know who else needs your money? B.J. Mendelson. So give him $5 by visiting buymeacoffee.com slash B.J. Mendelson. That website again is buymeacoffee.com slash B.J. Mendelson. Buymeacoffee.com slash B.J. Mendelson. And if you don't give B.J. your money, 
you and I are gonna have problems. Big ones. Hi, I'm Mike Reese. I've been writing for The Simpsons for 30 years. But in my spare time, I travel. I've been to Iran, Iraq, the North Pole, the South Pole, Chernobyl. <laughs> These are my vacations, folks. I've even been to North Korea. That's the scary Korea. It's all in my new travel podcast on the Believe Network called What Am I Doing Here? It's fast, it's funny, and it's factual enough. You'll hear how I was robbed in Rio, kidnapped in Honduras, dangled from a cliff in Pakistan, and chased by a lady with a meat cleaver again in Honduras. I had a lot of problems in Honduras. Each week I visit all the world's hot spots and hell holes so you don't have to. You're welcome. Download and subscribe to What Am I Doing Here? wherever you get your podcasts. Yes, I, I, I mean, it's most of the time you're not allowed to really be existential in shows unless you have a lot of other things. Like Tony Soprano did a lot of existential <laughs> thinking, but he's also killing people and there's a lot of other stuff going on, <laughs> which gives you a through line of action. And, you know, we didn't have that, but it was Ray and I would have conversations, um, contemplating all kinds of shit. And then once we got in the writer's room, we had a conversation with those writers. Um, and it really worked to put that kind of, put that stuff on the show. And again, it sort of gets back to in the writer's room, we have a lot of conversations that sometimes lead to story. But in this case, we, I guess, you know, got to talk about things that were happening in our lives, make sure they were interesting enough uh, and thematic enough to have a place on the show. But um, it, it was a little more of a one-to-one -one, um, basis. You know, even I'm trying to think of specific, uh, more specific examples that you're asking for. But, but you know, the, we were able to take some of the mundane things happening and make them interesting, even though they were still mundane, <laughs> you know? So I'll try to think of more specifics, but that was kind of the formula, I guess, writing wise that we, we talked about, you know? Did, did you study the works of, of TV writers? Was there anyone that like that stood out to you that, that you kind of, when you started getting into it yourself, that you, that you wanted to model after, or maybe you just follow uh, to some of the strategies that they put into their own scripts? Well, I mean, when I started writing, it was, you know, we're in the sitcom because that was every, everybody loves Raymond was my big sort of break, even though I had a show, I got a job before that on an MTV show and learned, learned to write some there. But Raymond was my boot camp for a lot of stuff. After that, and especially for men of a certain age, I think Alexander Payne and Jim Taylor were big models for us. Uh, that was at the time when, you know, Sideways had come out a couple years earlier. That was certainly a very well done male, um, trials and tribulations of male <laughs> thinking and stupidity and whatever. It reminds me of a humiliating, but probably deserved thing that happened when we first got into the HBO path offices and Carolyn Strauss asked us what the show was about. This is like, literally like, what have you guys been working on? Cause it was, well, anyway, there was a reason for the meeting, but, uh, and we said, well, it's a show about the pain of men. And she goes, Oh, are you in pain? <laughs> and I was like, you know what? We deserve that. We deserve that. Even though it is what the show, I mean, it, first of all, it was a pretentious sort of thing to say. Um, but it was also like, yeah, we're in a room full of women telling them we're going to do a show about, you know, the particular pain of men. It really wasn't about that, but I think, um, it was a, it was, it was a show that we, you know, Alexander Payne and Jim Taylor, wrote about the you know, two flawed, incredibly flawed guys in that. And that was certainly something we aspired to show, warts and all. Um, these guys are not perfect. They're not heroes. They have little victories, you know, that kind of thing. Yeah, you know, and it's interesting, too, like in, in this age now that we live in of uh, questions about, you know, what, what's it mean to be a, be a good guy in the 21st century and what's it mean to be mentally healthy as, as a guy? Like, I, I feel like, the show is even more timely now 
given sort of like this this like you know arguably like an existential crisis among among men. <laughs> uh, uh, so and it's you know it, it was very the thing that really spoke to us I think is you know the, the discussions of m- mental illness and uh, you know going to see a therapist and, and just seeing that on TV. Uh, and, and just some of the other struggles of, you know, is this as good as it gets, uh, makes it timely. And so when you, when you construct all of these different shows, uh, do you, do you set out to say, okay, like, we're going to make this something that, that holds up as opposed to, we're going to make something that's like 22 episodes that's just meant to just entertain? Yeah. I think, I mean, um, in general, we certainly, I certainly have an eye on, making sure it's relevant years from now. I mean, you can get into things where you're doing something that feels a topic that feels of the moment. Even on one day at a time, we did go after some, you know, quote unquote issues, but we always made sure, you know, we would never go, here's the headline in the newspaper. Let's do a show about that. Uh, it, it might, it might be a, a jumping off point for discussion sometimes, but the general thing was like, this is not a story unless our characters have a, are, are living through it in some way, you know, that it's actually their lives that are the issue, not the issue being inserted into their lives. Uh, you know, we did a lot of talk about between season two and season three about Me Too. And when we caught into the writer's room, we were like, we don't want to do a Me Too show because now it's a year later. And by the time a show comes out, it's a year and a half later. And, and, you know, we don't want to do a quote unquote me too show because that's what, how it'll come off. They wanted to do this issue. But the more we talked about it, the more people shared stories and we found the story that worked within our show so that we could do that quote unquote episode. But it was a personal story, you know, that it, the characters were living through it. And, um, you can look at it either way because you certainly watch the episode and go, Oh, they're tackling me too or whatever. But the story itself has to live through the characters. Absolutely. You know, so that you can watch it 20 years from now and not go, oh, yeah, that was like a big thing at the time, you know. And, and one day at a time, again, it's just absolutely beautiful show. I don't want anyone to think I'm like overlooking it by not, not breaking it up. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, I, but I feel, I feel like so much has been said about it. that there's like, I, have little, I have very little uh, more that's interesting to contribute to it. Um, so let me, let me ask you the, the, some of the questions I, I ask all my guests. And so I'm curious a bit about... Uh, what you're working on these days and the process of developing th- that thing. Yeah. Um, I uh, am fortunate enough to be on an overall deal at Sony uh, still, <laughs> and, um, and which started with one day at a time and has continued. And um, I'm also fortunate enough that they are interested in all kind. you know, I'm not being pigeonholed into one particular genre. So right now I'm pitching an animated show with my friend, uh, and a colleague, Alex Klein. So we're out there pitching that. Um, we, I'm, su- I just supervised, they call it a pilot, you know, basically worked with, basically I'm the old guy they brought in to work with the young, <laughs> the young kids. Um, uh, there was a pilot, animated pilot for Fox, um, with, uh, Tim Baltz and Lily Sullivan, who are a writing team, also a married couple. We had just, just finished writing this pilot that they've been working on for a while. Um, that went very well. We really had a great time. So we're actually waiting for sort of Fox to give us the feedback on that. And, um, I have a show that I, a drama that I wrote with Kit Boss, who I met on Lucky Louie and have continued to, uh, work with whenever I can. Um, we're having some people read that. We're trying to attach somebody. Um, that's a, a, a drama about a memory care facility. It's, it's about a lot of different things. So. It's a lot of, it's about a secret, about secrets, a lot of secrets. Um, but we have some very interesting people, big names reading that. So, but of course I'm not allowed to talk about that. <laughs> um, I'm looking at my board over here. Sorry for the <laughs> distraction. I'm working on a children's book with my daughter, who's an illustrator, oh. uh, who's trying to get into animation. And, um, what am I for? Oh, and I'm working on a multicam with my friend and colleague, Bridget Munoz Leibowitz. Um, that's, you know, being developed. So it's, Again, I can't really talk about it too much, but those are all the different things I'm working on. This is Rosie Tran from Rosie and BJ Save the World, a podcast asking big questions and discussing how to solve these big issues. This is a podcast for people just like you who ask, has the war on drugs been successful? Do we need universal basic income? Should we legalize sex work? Go to rosieandbjsavetheworld.com to get more confused.
Commercials suck, and hopefully one day we won't need them. But until that day comes, we have bills to pay, brother. What the fuck is this copy? I, I don't know, man. BJ wrote it, and I think he was high when he did it. How do you know he was high? I just, I read through it, and I just have a, I don't know, man, just read it. <laughs> what kind of bills do we have to pay? Well, for starters, you wouldn't believe how much it costs to feed a super intelligent ape who wants to kill Superman? Yes. At first he said he would pay BJ rent, but then some asshole told the ape about squatters', squatters rights? Right. Yep. And he's a super villain, you know, so he stopped paying rent, and now we all kind of work for him? He's a terrible boss. One time he was eating some guy's face and just left the rest of him in the middle of the floor. I guess it's better than working at Amazon, though? Anyway, the apes got this cool-ass setup in the basement of BJ's mom's house. You should see it. There's this kick-ass pool down there. I have no idea how you get a huge pool in the basement of a small house, but he found a way. Separate lines, he found a way. Now, if only... The ape could remember to take out the garbage in his office before he leaves for the weekend. Everyone else does it. And that includes Stephen Wheat, who works in accounting and shits out of his mouth? <laughs> anyway, that's what's going on here in Harriman, New York, home, home of the... Yeah, man, I'm pretty sure he was high, but let's just get back to it. <laughs> now, let's get back to the show. I'd love to ask about the children's book. Um, <laughs> sure. That, that, that sounds delightful. And, and so uh, what is what has that process been like, Clabra? <laughs> I have with meetings one. with my daughter where I text her and she's up in her room. And, you know, my so my daughter graduated from RISD uh, a little over a year ago-ish. Uh, she graduated, well, I guess it's now almost two years ago. She graduated during the pandemic, but then she continued to take classes to finish up her degree. She's an illustration major and she teaches. She teaches art. Um, part time right now. And we just decided why it was almost we're in this situation where we're in the same house together for God knows, um, I shouldn't say God knows how long, how, who knows when she'll move out. So let's just do this now <laughs> when we're actually in a, you know, we have our work, li- work home life is just merged, uh, whether we like it or not. So I wrote or am writing the story which I think for a children's book, I have the easy part. There's not a lot of words in general. And she is doing all the illustrations, which is what much more labor. So I got the easy part. But yeah, we meet like once a week. She shows me a few uh, more illustrations and we're, uh, you know, we'll probably pitch, like pitch it, try to show it to some publishers, but we're fine publishing it ourselves as well. And, you know, probably give the, uh, uh, do it for give the profits to charity and you know it's it's really just so we can do this together and and put out a book with a good message the don't say gay thing in florida really got my uh mine and her ire up so yes. we want to do something um it, it doesn't directly address that but that that's what inspired us in writing a children's book uh well count me in to buy one uh okay good first good. next one I will buy it for a slide. Yeah. Uh, so one of the questions I usually ask is, you know, what's what's the best advice you ever got? But I'm curious what the best writing advice you, you may have given to your daughter and what that might have been. You know, I, I, I think I'd have to go back and answer the previous question because she's more of an illustrator. She she, she I, I think she's a writer, but she insists <laughs> I don't want to write. <laughs> this may just be a rebellion, so I'm not really sure. <laughs> um, I can definitely say the best writing advice I ever got I mean, I can, there's a, a lot of examples, but the one that always sticks in my mind is actually from Norman Lear, and that was from re- reading his book, even, which was he used to have incredible writer's block, and he would sit at the, he, the computer. He would sit at the typewriter, and the reason he wears the little white hat is because he would have such writer's block that he started picking at his scalp and would, like, you know, have, like, cuts from him lacerating his own scalp when he put on a hat to hide it. And he went to a therapist to talk about his writer's block, and the therapist gave him advice, something in the, along the lines of, you have all these ideas, uh, uh, you know, uh, trapped in your head. And what's happening is it's almost like 
someone's yelling fire and they can't get all out. You're not letting them out. You know, you need to let everybody out and then organize them later, you know, and he, I don't know if the therapist told him this or he figured out the system, but he, he started dictating. He started dictating and then he'd have an assistant to type up his stuff. And he said he wrote like three screenplays like that and it completely unstuck him. And it's not, I mean, this is not un, unheard of advice really, but for me, I have the same problem. You know, I'm a perfectionist and I sit in front of the page and I, and even when I learned in film school and I was a writing minor, you know, free write, just let, let your thoughts go. But there was something about that that always felt like, oh, I don't know, I'm just typing a lot and then I never look at it again. If I go and I record myself just blathering on and then I type it, now I have an assistant, so sometimes she types it up. Um, it's so, it so advances my thought process. It really always feels productive um, because for some reason I can then put everything into its proper context. Sometimes it was just a fleeting thought that doesn't really deserve much more thought. But often it, it's something to be able to really consider that would have sat stuck at like sentence number two if I had just been like, let me try to mm, think about it. So that combined with, for me, I like to run. I'm a runner. I run three times a week. And it always unlocks my subconscious. And that's not available to everybody. Running's not for everybody. But for me, it, it really, um, I always leave with a writing problem and I come back with a solution. It doesn't always work, but it's something. Yeah, no, that, that's fascinating because it, you're triggering flow states in, in two different ways. And so that's, that's very, I think that that's something that maybe creatives don't really think much about is like flow and making sure that you, it had to get into it. And so for you, it's running and speaking, speaking the words all out. Yes. And I would just add that it also lets me let myself off the hook. So I don't have to be like working all the time, Yes, you know, cause you're, you put so much pressure on yourself and oh, you sh I should be working and I should be writing. But I, you know, if I bark something for 20 minutes into my voice memo, that's work. And then I, I'll go, okay, give myself a break and then I'll go back and look at it later. And you know, that, that's probably the same as two hours in front of the screen, like waiting for the genius to come out. Um, so it's really helped me have a better work life balance. <laughs> I have time for one more question. So before I get to it, uh, where, where can we find you? What, what would you like us to search out and, and look up? Um, so everybody loves Raymond is on Peacock. Uh, men of a certain age is on HBO Max and listed is on Hulu. One Day at a Time is on Netflix. Unfortunately, the fourth season is probably on demand on some cable systems, but it's a little bit in limbo right now. We're trying to find a way to get it united with its brothers and sisters. Um, and other things are on DVD, but those are the streamers. That's what's happening streaming-wise. I'd love to know, what would you say to your younger self? Like, if you had a time machine, you can go back to talk to, your, like, 18, 19-year-old you. Like, what would you say? I would definitely say... Gave yourself a break. Um, I, I, um, I got super duper depressed in college a couple of times because I was a film major and it was Ithaca College. It was a pretty small film department. It's Ithaca is a pretty well known film department now. Back then it wasn't quite as well known. My only point is that it, this was, I wasn't even at USC, like, you know, the quote unquote best thing. I thought, since I was at Ithaca, uh, if I'm not the best here, how can I even be the best? You know, I'm going to be jumping into a much bigger pool. So then I would be competitive and someone else would do something that was better than what I did and be like, well, I fucking suck. You know, I suck and I'm never going to make it. And I try, I was writing a screenplay my, my senior year. I couldn't make it past page 30 because I just got all in my head and I couldn't figure out what I didn't know what I was doing. And, uh, and I, I did not ask for help. You know, that was my biggest problem. I did not ask for help. I was not open to just scared to share my thoughts with other people. And all of it just could be put in a basket of like putting too much pressure on yourself. You don't have to be great when you're 20. You know, not everyone is Spielberg. You know, that was the thing back then. <laughs> um, Spielberg already had an office at Universal when he was your age. So, all of that. It's all, I didn't get my first writing job till I was 34, almost 35. And, um, I mean, the Raymond job, I should say. And things take time. Everything takes time and just use it to 
live a good life and learn and work, and it'll come to you. That was beautiful. <laughs> Thank huh? you. Well, that's our show. And uh, our, our apologies to the band. You know, we kind of just ran out of time. That's kind of the uh, that's the nature of things. It's the, it's the name of the game. <laughs> hey, hey, hey. Vaped Crusaders comes out on the 20th of every month. The 20th. You can't smoke that in here. Uh, oh, wait. What day is it now? Do I look like a fucking calendar to you? Hey, man, I don't need all the attitude and stuff you know i don't i don't need it well i don't need your face your vape or your are those air jordan 3 ogs yeah yes those are 45 hundred dollar sneakers i know they're pretty sweet yeah they are no wait i don't like you don't make me like you i'm not man i'm just out here i'm just trying to relax dude i'm on to you pal you're trying to do some Jedi mindfuck bullshit, and... <laughs> I don't I don't think that's what it's called. I don't think that's the thing. You want to play mind games with me, motherfucker? All right, let's dance. Sorry. Um, make sure to tune in to Vape Crusaders. New episodes are going to drop every month on the 20th right here on Weibo.tv. Whew. Okay, your, your, your middle name is Macho. But uh, I'm wondering if you ever cry. You ever Has a Macho Man ever cried? Yeah. Really? Uh-huh. It's okay for Macho Men to show every emotion available right there, you know, because I've cried a thousand times, I'm going to cry some more. But... I've soared with the eagles, and I've slithered with the snakes, and I've been everywhere in between. And I'm going to tell you something right now. There's one guarantee in life, and that there are no guarantees, yeah. And Mm -hmm. I understand this. (laughs) Nobody likes a quitter. Nobody said life was easy, so if you get knocked down, take the standing eight count, get back up, and fight again. Did you enjoy today's show? If you did, please take a minute and leave us a review. Yes, we know you're busy and every podcast asks you to do this, but there's a good reason they do. Because every time you leave a review, that review helps more people find and listen to the show. And you know what that means for you? More great episodes of Weiwo.tv. So what are you waiting for? Take out your phone and leave us a review right now before you move on to something else and forget about us. And we'll see you next time, right?